Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our next installment of our webinar series sponsored by the United States Aquaculture Society, the National Aquaculture Association, and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Today, we're extremely fortunate have, to have with us Dr. Claude Boyd, a noted water quality expert, who will be sharing some of his knowledge about aeration in theory and in practice. Uh, Dr. Boyd is well known for his contributions to research in the field of water quality and has over 50 years of aquaculture experience. He's logged countless miles traveling the globe and sharing his knowledge with farmers, universities, and government organizations. Dr. Boyd has authored hundreds of research articles and numerous books on the subject and mentored many students as well as faculty from around the world. I know we're all anxious to get started, but I wanted to cover a couple of pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Please remember to keep your microphone muted as we go forward. And if you have questions, type them into the chat box and we'll try and get to them at the end of the presentation. In the coming weeks, you'll be receiving a survey uh, about these webinars and their impact and their benefits to you and also give you a chance to uh, provide input for future uh, webinar topics. So please take the time to fill that out when you do get it. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Boyd, since that's why everybody's here. Dr. Boyd, it's all yours. Take it away. Okay. Well, I'm pleased to be able to speak with you. It's a little odd not having people out in front of you there where I can see you, but that's the times we live in. Aquaculture has really become a production method for animal protein is based mostly on the application of feeds. So feeding has become a very common practice to allow greater production than possible from natural food organisms. <laughs> and this feed, even though it greatly increases production, not all used for the fish, you know, a relatively small amount of it's actually used for the fish because that feed that goes in is mostly dry matter. It's about 90% dry matter. And the fish that you take out is only about 25% dry matter. So, you know, if you get an FCR 1.5, that's fine from an economic standpoint. But from a water quality standpoint, that's not true. It's, uh, you know, it's much more waste going into the water. Much more of the feed goes into the water as waste than goes into the fish to produce biomass. And if you increase those feeding rates very much, the water quality of the pond deteriorates to the point that, you know, the fish are suffering from oxygen depletion and they more susceptible to disease and they even die. And with most species, somewhere feeding rate above 30 kilograms per hectare per day, you're going to need to either stop feeding and not feed anymore or to aerate. And tilapia are a little exception to this because they're tolerant to low oxygen and maybe twice as much feed could be used or even more, but they are more tolerant to oxygen than most others. So the feed is just kind of shows the fate of the feed. The feed goes in, part of it's not eaten. Now that uneaten part is much larger for shrimp than it is for fish. Fish, you know, virtually all the feed, if it's fed properly, will be consumed. The shrimp nibble, and they probably lose, you know, anywhere from 80 to 10 to 20 percent of the feed just ends up entering the water, never being eaten. And so the, the part that's actually absorbed for the culture species, part of it's excreted as feces, that's probably another 10 or 20 percent. That's the the remainder is absorbed across the intestine, and then a lot of that is excreted as ammonia and CO2 across the gills, and only a portion of it ends up harvested in the culture species. And then of this waste that goes into the water, well, one portion of it up there that came from the uneaten feed species is still in the form of organic matter, so it's broken down by the bacteria. And then the part that's excreted by the fish, you know, it's mainly ammonia and CO2 and phosphate and a few things like that. And so the microbial decomposition of the organic matter then produces ammonia, carbon dioxide, and phosphate. And this ends up in pond systems at least, causing more phytoplankton production, and they die and use off. 
oxygen and the nutrients are recycled and so forth. I think most people are vaguely familiar with this, but what I want to point out about air, a couple of things here about aeration. In the first place, fish have a, and shrimp have a unique problem with, well, I would say unique. Any kind of aquatic animal has a problem with respiration compared to a land animal. You know, you can calculate, I won't get into the calculation part of it, but I'll tell you what it comes out. If you wanted to expose the respiratory surface, or the alveoli and the lung of the land animal to what comes in contact with the gill of an aquatic animal, the amount of oxygen, the amount of the weight of water that has to be pumped across those gill membranes to expose that surface to one gram of oxygen, or any quantity of oxygen for that matter, would be 253 times more than the weight of the air to expose the same amount of oxygen as land out. So for that reason, you know, oxygen is a, a, a very important limiting factor in the production of aquatic animals, and especially when you know stacking them together like in a feedlot situation, you know, you put animals in a feedlot and you don't have to aerate the, you know, just the natural circulation of the air brings it, replaces the oxygen, it's used up respiration, it gets rid of the CO2. But in the pond, that's not quite so simple. The water doesn't circulate here as well as air. The other thing that people don't seem to understand a lot of times about aeration is most of that oxygen that's provided by aeration doesn't end up being respired by the culture species. Most of that oxygen goes for the oxidation of waste in the system. So you have to understand that about aeration. It's, when you put aeration in, that aerator transfers a kilogram of oxygen to the water, well, not near a kilogram of oxygen is available to the fish or the shrimp. Now you could come up with, you know, I think most of you are with the biological oxygen demand, and that's the amount of oxygen it takes to oxidize the organic matter in a waste. And, you know, you can think of the feed as having a BOD if you want to, and the BOD would be the amount of oxygen required to oxidize organic carbon and the nitrogen applied to the pond or to the other culture system and feed, but not recovered in the biomass at harvest. And you know, but what I mean by oxidizing nitrogen is fish straight ammonia. Then the bacteria, some of the bacteria in the pond, the nitrogen bacteria oxidizes ammonia to nitrate, and that takes a lot of oxygen. And the organic carbon is converted to CO2, and that takes quite a bit of oxygen also. You know, there, there's the oxygen to carbon ratio. It doesn't matter who's doing the decomposition, whether it's fish, shrimp, bacteria, or people, or cattle, or whatever, you know, that's going to be the ratio of the oxygen to carbon organic carbon and respiration. So if you put a kilogram of carbon that gets respired away, that's going to take 2.67 kilograms of oxygen. And for nitrification, there's a summary equation for nitrification there, the ammonia plus water. It's carried out by bacteria, of course, but that ratio is 4.57. So for each unit of ammonia, of nitrogen and ammonia, this Nitrified and nitrate, it takes 4.57 units of oxygen. Most of the oxygen is required for oxidizing carbon because there's a lot more carbon in the waste than there is tonight, is nitrogen. But that, that equation right there would give you the BOD of feed, you know, if you took the amount of Carbon in the feed and subtract off of the amount of carbon you harvest in the fish and multiply that times 2.67. And you take the nitrogen in the feed and you subtract off the nitrogen in the fish and multiply that times 4.57. That's the BOD of the feed. You know, if, if, it, if all that waste from the feed gets oxidized. And there's some values for the, what would be the BOD of feed. You know, the, the assumption is that the feeds, about, in this particular calculation, is that the feeds about 45% 40, carbon and 5% nitrogen, and the live fish are about 12% uh, carbon and 2.5% nitrogen. Now, the values would be slightly different if we had some other concentrations of carbon and nitrogen in the feed or the fish or the shrimp. 
But uh, that's roughly what you would get. And you see, as the FCR increases in the pond, the more the feed BOD per, per pound of feed. But the main thing is, you know, the more feed you put in, the greater the oxygen demand. That's the only point I'm going to make here. Now, in wastewater engineering, when I, when I first figured out you could calculate this feed BOD, I said, well, that's nice. You can take that and do like you do in wastewater engineering and calculate the amount of, the amount of aeration you need. And I'll follow up on that in a minute because that doesn't turn out to be the case. But uh, in a pond, you know, the more plankton you've got in the water, the more dissolved oxygen you have in the daytime, but the lower the dissolved oxygen goes at night. I, I think everyone's seen curves like that. So the plankton bloom increases, or the waste flow in the pond increases. You know, you have a greater rate of photosynthesis, but you also have a greater rate of respiration. And the oxygen demands go very low in the morning where there's a, a lot of waste going into the pond or a lot of plankton in the pond. And of course, in some of these uh, heterotrophic systems, the plankton basically disappears. You know, it's all replaced by bacteria, and then aeration is the main source of oxygen, even in the pond. And this is just a picture I had there. One of the students here one time around the aerator in the end of a catfish pond over in West Alabama. And you can see that's like soup. That water there is just full of plankton drifting up in that corner. But all over the pond, it was almost that big. So the, uh, the plankton blooms in ponds get awful dense. Now, this is an old slide we did from years ago, but I assume things haven't really changed much since then. But along the y-axis of that slide, I, I'm sorry, the x-axis of that slide, we've got the feed input per day, up to 50 kilograms per hectare per day. And on the other side, on the y-axis, y we got the dissolved oxygen concentration in the early morning and the second disc visibility. And you see as the feeding rate increases, generally the second disc visibility decreases, but also the dissolved oxygen concentration don't decreases. And you know, once you get past about 30 here, the concentration of oxygen begins to get something you know, on the feeding rate beyond about 30 kilograms per hectare is the concentration of oxygen becomes low enough that it begins to stress the fish. You know, during the day it's higher, but the fish get stressed in the early morning. They don't feel like eating as well the rest of the day, even though there may be plenty of oxygen there. Now, some farmers use water exchange to try to flush out the waste. And of course, if you have a high enough rate of water exchange, you can do that. But unless you pump 25 to 50% of the pond volume per day through the pond, you're not going to have much success with the water exchange. Now, water exchange may be necessary too in some shrimp ponds to avoid high salinity in the dry season or in areas where the farms are in an arid climate. And, and some types of cultured ponds and raceways, of course, it depends on high rate of water exchange. You know, some of these raceways may have several exchanges per day, per hour, or per day, or even or per day, but some even two or three exchanges per hour. So water exchange is widely used in aquaculture, but it's not nearly as effective as aeration in general. Rule. People should monitor dissolved oxygen in their ponds just to make sure they've got enough. And I don't know what the best concentration is, but I would certainly say you don't want the dissolved oxygen concentration to drop below three milligrams per liter. And really not having it drop below four milligrams per liter would be good. But of course, in some marine systems or shrimp, I think you'd have a hard time preventing it from going below four. It's even hard in freshwater systems to prevent that. But unless you just really over aerate the pond, you know, you, if you have enough aeration there to prevent it from going under forward any time, then there are probably times when the pond's going to be greatly aerated. So it's a little hard to know what the pick is of minimum concentration. I, I did see a study done once where they had a lot number of species of fish, the US, US EPA did, and uh, they kind of concluded that 
When the auction got under about 50% of sash erosion, most species of fish didn't grow quite as well, but you didn't get any real big effects till it gets on down, you know, maybe to 25 to 30% of sash erosion. And in unaerated ponds, uh, this exchange of water is intended both to flush out waste, but it also, you know, it, it work, it, if the water coming in may be a little bit higher in oxygen, so you get some oxygen from the water exchange, but generally not so much. But if you can flush a lot of water through, sometimes that can prevent fish from dying. I know in the old days before we had aeration, there were fishery stations at Auburn when they'd have an oxygen depletion of pond and get a big pump and pump water from one pond into the pond that had the problem and try to provide enough oxygen for the fish in a zone there. But water exchange is just generally not very effective for maintaining oxygen. But this is some work at Les Torrance. It used to work at Mississippi State University did. This was for channel catfish and I think the same curve would apply to most warm water culture organisms, except for maybe for tilapia would be a little different. But on the x-axis, on the y-axis over there, he's got the food consumption as percent of the high VO control, you know, where he had the most oxygen. And you see, if the oxygen concentration, the minimum oxygen concentration in the morning, is there between two and three milligrams per liter of parts per million? You don't see much difference in food consumption than you would if it maintained five milligrams per liter minimum in the pump. So it's kind of on that data there that I base that conclusion that if you maintain oxygen above three milligrams per liter, and a catfish pond is okay, a shrimp pond is probably, you know, shrimp. Have about a, have a similar oxygen requirement. Most, most warm water species, well, like cold water species, you're going to have to have more oxygen. Probably only going below five milligrams per liter for cold water species. <clears throat> now, this is a just a this is not a FCR that's based on putting a feeding ring in the pond and taking out the uneaten feed. This is just. Based on what happened when you feed the fish like they're generally feeding the commercial. And when we tried to publish this, we they wouldn't let us publish it because we claimed this was the FCR. We said, well, this is what farmers do. They put it in there and they don't take it out in the feed ring, but the journal insisted that they had to be based on what the fish ate at day. But you know, putting that all aside, I'm gonna show it to you anyway because. <clears throat> That's what a farmer would see, you know, because they don't use a feeding ring to take that feed out. And as the early morning meal concentration increased, you see, we got a better feed conversion data. See those ponds that had early morning dissolved out from concentration of about three milligrams per liter and greater had the best feed conversion. Now here's some data of shrimp yield where they Managed to have different early morning dissolved oxygen concentrations between two points. Well, see, it was set up to try to maintain two, three, and four, but it couldn't quite be achieved. Got 2.3, 2.96, 3.89 is the average, and you can see the survival in the shrimp yields in the FCR. And that's not a particularly good FCR, even at the high oxygen, but this was done a long time ago. Wasn't as much known about feed and shrimp. And, but anyway, the, the principle you can see in this study that you maintain better oxygen, you'll get better yields and better SCR. And this is a similar data with some the wildfield where they had maintained some of the ponds around 10% of saturation and others around 30% of saturation in the morning. Had a control where the oxygen just dropped, however low it would drop. They all had the same stocking rates. And you see the fish tended to be bigger because they had more oxygen, but there really wasn't much of a difference between 10% saturation and the control. So you can see from this that tilapia are much hardier than uh, the other species I've been talking about. Because of you know, that channel catfish data that Thorns had, probably around that three milligrams per liter is probably on up around between 30 and 40% saturation. If you don't believe it, 
the other things used most of the oxygen, I hope I can convince you here because these are some calculated oxygen, nighttime oxygen budgets. Of course, these are channel catfish ponds. This was a 12, some of 12 hour night. The first part of that's available oxygen. And in the water column and dust, you would have about 100 kilograms per hectare. And the diffusion from the air during the night would give you an additional approximately 10 kilograms per hectare. That's a total of 110 kilograms per hectare of oxygen. Well, the demand for oxygen for the fish, you see, is only about 60 kilograms per hectare. You know, this is a high standard stock of fish, 15,000 kilograms per hectare. The water column respiration is around 120 twice the fish. That's the plankton and the bacteria, and zooplankton, and, you know, phytoplankton, zooplankton, bacteria, and the water column. The sediment respiration is about 420, I mean 42, I'm sorry. And the total is 222. So there's a deficit there of 112 kilograms of oxygen per hectare for the night. And that means that you're going to keep those fish alive. You're going to have to supply that oxygen with a mechanical aerator. Or they're going to die. Now, I thought when I first figured out that you could do that calculation of the VOD on B, that we could take these wastewater engineering calculations where they, they know in a wastewater treatment basin how much the waste load is. You know, these things are lined with concrete. They just dump the sewage in there. There's not, there might be some sediment at the bottom, but they keep it stirred up pretty good in those systems, you know, so it doesn't accumulate. And so they can calculate how much oxygen is being used per hour. And those things are actually measured. And they can estimate from the performance of the aerator that they've done in tests how much, how many horsepower aeration they need to supply the amount of oxygen they need per hour. So we thought we could do that with. Ponds, but it turned out you can't do it. It's just impossible. The amount of aeration cannot be calculated from the hourly oxygen demand and the aerator SC, SAE. That's a standard aeration efficiency. I'll mention what this is in a minute. It's done in wastewater because the oxygen demand varies and it's virtually impossible to measure in aquaculture ponds. Usually, one horsepower of aeration is enough for about 400 to 500 kilogram increments of fish or shrimp. And for tilapia, maybe seven to 800. I don't really know. I've never seen that worked out for tilapia. <clears throat> so what you can do is you can figure out how many fish you want to produce. And you kind of know what the, you know, the biomass is going to be at the end of the crop. And if you want to put all the aerators you're going to need during the grow out period, you know, at the end of the grow out period, in at once, you can put in about one horsepower of aeration for every four or five hundred kilograms of fish or shrimp that you expect to produce, or if it's a lot, get some of these. Well, now you're not going to need all that aeration all during the season, so you can't just use part of it at first and later on you stage in more. You run all those aerators from the beginning, you know, you're going to waste a lot of electricity because they're going to provide more oxygen you need. <laughs> so the Zob doctor monitoring allows the aeration rate and the, and the time of day of aeration and so forth to be adjusted. So let's say a little bit about aerators. There's really two ways to which these aerators transfer oxygen to the water. One, they splash the water up into the air, and the other one is they release bubbles into the water. You know, when you splash the water into the air, it spreads the water out so there's more surface for the oxygen to enter the water. You know, the aerator can't put any oxygen in the water. All they can do is splash the water up into the air. And then these bubbler, these diffuser systems that produce bubbles, well, the oxygen concentration in the bubble is higher than the air. So the oxygen in the bubble diffuses into the water. So the aerator didn't really put anything in there. It just releases air into the water. And those bubbles increase the surface area so you get more diffusion into the water. So those are the two basic kinds. I do have these pure oxygen systems, but it's really hard to get a very good efficiency out of them in a pond. And so these uh, indoor culture systems, you can do a better job of that, but not out in a big pond. 
And I want to mention here the driving force of aeration is a difference in the oxygen concentration or saturation and the oxygen concentration of the water. So you can see from this slide that the, the aeration is much more efficient at zero oxygen. But of course, all your fish is going to be dead then when you shrink. So you can't operate it down there. You're going to have to operate it up here somewhere around three parts per million. And you see there, the aerator is only going to be operating maybe 50 to 60 percent of its efficiency that they have in these tests. Because at the test, the, the oxygen transfer rate is calculated at zero. And so you see the closer that curve becomes to saturation, the slower the aeration rate is. So with aeration, you just read it. Need to try to raise oxygen to five to six parts per million because that's where the aerator is most efficient. And when the pond has more oxygen than that in it, you can turn the aerator off. Use basically these green water ponds, they're not true in the fire flop systems. So uh, you need to pay attention to the oxygen concentration and stage in the aeration. So in, in terms of the types of aeration, there's gravity aeration where you just use gravity to aerate the water. The, the trout raceway is a, a good example of gravity aeration. Those, those, units, those raceway units go down the slope. The water falls from one to the other and that white water zone there where the water is falling we get some re aeration because of the surface there the water is increased there by falling over that weir. Here's a, where they're using well water and a hatchery said they're running the water through a screen there and it's falling through the screen and being aerated as it goes down. Where you pump water into a pond and release it, you can put one of these alfalfa valves like this on there and restrict the flow out the end of the pipe so that it has to splash out to the sides and you get some degree of aeration, but not a whole lot. And, but uh, Aerators are made to splash a lot of water into the air. That's a simple type that's quite popular in Asia. The Taiwan style paddle wheel aerator. They're probably the most widely used aerator in the world, but they're not very durable and they're not very efficient. They drill all those holes in the paddles and that messes them up and you can't convince anybody of that. But, you know, the water passing through that hole causes a lot of friction. And they've got too many paddles around it. It's got a lot of problems, but it's the most widely used aerator in the world because it's so cheap. It's really cheap. You know, you, you figured over a long time a better quality device is better than it. Then there's some aerators in the US that are just used for emergency aeration. These great big paddle wheel devices that run off power takeoff of the tractor. There's a number of Different forms, you know, the, the, these are some of the original ones up there at the top and down at the bottom are some of the newer versions, but they splash a lot of water. The air, they, they can prevent a dial, but it's awful inefficient. You know, the energy from the tractor is powering that thing and not used very efficiently. This is some aerators they use in Asia. They got many variations of this, but you know, there's a motor up here on the pond embankment that you uh, really can't see. That way you can see the down here, but now nah, you really can't see it. But there's a motor up there that, <clears throat> that a jack shaft mechanism to slow down the output speed of the motor, and this goes down this water pipe sitting connected there. We splash the water like that. <clears throat> Pretty inefficient. Now they're the, the construction is very cheap. So they don't have bearings. So they just put the shaft in those wooden slots there. But that's why they use. Here's some of the newer style, but still, you know, they're very inefficient. And they also have some underwater aerators in there. You see, trying to bubble air into the water. And over here, they've got a Arrow 2 aerator. I'll show you a picture of that. In a bit. Nah, I'm sorry. That's not what that is there. That's a Sludge pump, they're trying to pump sludge out of the pump. We did a lot of work on mechanical aerators here in Auburn years ago. 
because the farmers were wanting an aerator and they couldn't talk any of them. Agricultural engineers into working with them, and I finally was just kind of forced to work on those things. And so with the graduate students here, we did a good bit of work on what they say we got a torque sensor and put in line with the aerator shaft and devised a mechanism where we could make all kind of changes in the shapes of the paddle, which is kind of a modular unit, put more paddles on, and different arrangements of paddles, and different kinds of paddles. We worked on that thing probably about three years. We probably run several thousand aerator teams. But we ended up designing a paddle wheel and then the farmers took that design, well, not the farmers, but some of the machinists around took that design and they figured out how to mount it on floats, and how to connect the electric motor to it. It was a lot of things happened over the years. They had a lot of problems. We had a lot of problems developing the thing, but they had equally a lot of problems of trying to figure out what kind of motor and gearbox they could use or whether it's better to use chain drives or belt drives or so forth. There's been a lot of work going. on. That's a, a very efficient aerator. There's a, a picture of something based similar to the original, although we, we didn't recommend that shape paddle. The paddle we actually recommended was this, the shape over here on the right. It has a 135 degree interior angle. But what it did was we, we recommended the whole oh, 96 paddles. Back on this one over here had a bunch of the paddles taken out so to make it cheaper. So I'm sure this one is not near as efficient for that one because that, that's a paddle surface here. But uh, there's one of them in the water running. But that type of aerator is quite efficient, although there's a number of other types of aerators, and I'm not trying to rank one over the other. This aerator here, we originally got some real high numbers for oxygen transfer, around four pounds, four, four and a half pounds of oxygen per, it's in pounds, so I'm giving to per horsepower hour. And we later found out that the tank we initially did those tests down, you know, we, I didn't get it this by my own intention. People wanted it done. And, we used what we had available to us. That tank wasn't quite big enough, and it, it resulted in us reporting a fairly a, high, a higher value than they really transferred. <coughs> time later, when we got some better aeration tanks around, found out that it really was more like around three to three and a half pounds of oxygen transfer hours, but still a lot more than those Asian aerators transfer. Then here's a type that some people use as a float. With a, a submersible motor under it with a pellet on it, jets the water into the air like that. One of the problems with aerators is everybody thinks, you know, they're very simple. So everybody thinks that they can make an aerator, and once they make it, it's like they made it just perfect. And, you know, that you can look at that aerator and tell it's doing fairly well. I, I didn't put it in here, but I got another picture. They want to revive, improve this aerator. So they put some kind of different kind of propeller on it, impeller. And now it throws water way up in the air, you know, way up high in the air. And they brought it down here and wanted us to taste it. I said, well, the old one's better. Oh, no, this other one, you know, looks very pretty. It's throwing all that water up there. We ran a test. The one that's throwing the water way up there transferred about a third as much oxygen as the other. And, of course, the reason is that it didn't pump near as much water. It just threw it up a lot higher. You know, the water was just taking a joy ride after it got about three feet high and it wasn't taking on much more oxygen. So the problem is that everybody see most people that see aerators will pick the most inefficient one as being the most efficient because they're impressed by the fine spray or the water going way up in the air. And uh, what you really want is an aerator to pump a lot of water up into this zone, if it's a surface aerator, up in this zone where it's uh, transferring oxygen. And this is a propeller aspirator pump type. That particular one is this Aero 2 aerator. It's had a lot of use. It's a, a kind of a fishing aerator. It's a, it's a different mechanism. It's, what it's got is a, 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 hot, a rotating hollow shaft inside of the thing. And there's a diffuser down near that impeller. And the impeller jets the water forward, and it, there's a there's a housing around that hollow shaft. It's got a hole in it up here near the aerator, and air is 
force down in there to the atmosphere is that impeller evacuates a shaft. So it's an aspirator type device. And you can see the water comes out with air in it and very small bubbles. It's a very efficient device. This is some of them in shrimp ponds operating. You can see with the old aerators, though, you're going to see kind of what you see here that the water is going to be going at a pretty good velocity right in front of those aerators. But the farther out you go, the slower the water movement gets. So these aerators create a lot of water movement around them. And I, and I tell you, an aerator that sends the water forward, like a paddle wheel aerator or like these propeller aspirator pumps, are much more efficient in a larger body of water than one like that. Because you see, this aerator just pulls in the water around it. And pretty soon, it gets a high oxygen concentration of the water all around that aerator. And that reduces the efficiency of aeration as the concentration of oxygen in the water increases. But these aerators that push the water away from the aerator, you <coughs> see, they're always bringing in water behind them that has lower oxygen. So the efficiency of the aerator is declining over time. And then these are the diffused air aeration systems and use our air blower to release <coughs> oxygen through an underwater diffuser. And a big problem on those things is that the water depth is usually not great enough for the hang time of the bubble to be sufficient to allow a lot of bubbles. Oxygen transfer, you know, they may only transfer one or two percent of the oxygen that's in the water. So those are not very efficient generally, but if you got a deeper tank, they are. But enhancers are very nice because you can use one device to power a lot of individual units. They're just not very good at all. And then these new jet aerators, they're kind of a variation of that two aerator I showed you. They just have a venture device and air is sucked down in here and mixed in this through this injector. And they eject the water horizontally with the pond bottom. That arrow two had to eject the water somewhat at an angle. These put it down at the bottom. So there's more use of that jet aerator now than used to be, but I think most of those devices are fairly expensive compared to the others. And the aerator performance test to see how efficient these aerators are done in a tank of clean water, just usually municipal tap water. And you deoxygenate that water with sodium sulfide, and you re aerate the water with the aerator that's going to be tested. And you measure the dissolved oxygen concentration with time while the aerator re aerates the water in that tank. And then these results can be used to, I won't get into the details about this, but there's a mathematical technique for estimating the amount of oxygen that can be put into the water. And if you divide that amount of oxygen by the power of the aerator, you know how much? It, well, it's calculated different ways. You can't calculate the power of the, that goes to the aerator shaft, but more commonly, they just count the power going into the motor, which is the wire power as opposed to the brake power. And uh, report the SEC on the, <clears throat> the wire power. Sometimes they just report it on the horsepower rating of the aerator motor. But at any rate, just so uh, SAs usually report it in kilograms of oxygen per kilowatt hour kilograms of oxygen per horsepower well. And there's this equation I was talking about for calculating how much oxygen the aerator will actually transfer under operating conditions. I, I won't get into the equation, but there's a, where I saw the equation, you see if the oxygen was, there's some other, I, I won't go into those other, but there's some minor losses you get involved in there and so on. I, I won't talk about those, but they have to do with the with things that are contained in the water that affect the aeration rate. <clears throat> but if, if you had zero oxygen and this aerator had been ranked in a test in clean water to transfer, transfer 1.15 pounds of oxygen per horsepower hour in the pond, it would actually transfer about 96% of this value, you know, about 96% of that, of the, uh, wait, wait, I told you wrong, I'm sorry, I didn't look up here. 
Say the aerator has an efficiency of 1.2 kilograms of oxygen per horsepower hour. See, I already made a mistake in this slide and never noticed it before. That should be kilograms of oxygen per horsepower hour, okay? It doesn't matter, you're going to have to change it one place or the other, you know, it's just an example, but I'm sorry about that. I've never noticed it. But if it was ranked at one point, two kilograms of oxygen per horsepower hour, then, you know, we got to have kilograms here. And so the SEC would be about 96, you know, the value was actually transferred through the acceleration efficiency would be about 96% of the SAC, or you'd get about 1.15 instead of 1.2 and uh, kilograms of oxygen horsepower hour. And see if you get down here to say three parts of million oxygen in the water, it's only going to be transferred at about 61% of the SAE here. And so the instead of transferring 1.2 kilograms of oxygen horsepower, it's only going to be about 0.73. And see the higher the oxygen concentration of the pond, the less efficient that device becomes. And when the water reaches saturation of the oxygen, this was at 28 degrees centigrade, and there's the saturation concentration, it doesn't transfer any oxygen. And if the aerator, if the water has more than oxygen saturation in it, that aerators are going to become a deoxygenator and increase the rate at which aeration enters the air. Now they make devices now that you can put into the water that monitors the oxygen concentration and it'll send a signal back to either start or stop the aerator. You, you, you program this all in and what oxygen concentration you want the aerator to come on and at what oxygen concentration you want the aerator to go off. And you can manage the aerator through this automatic monitoring system to prevent, well, to prevent wasting electricity on aeration. So uh, with aeration, you know, you need to get the most, you know, an efficient aerator. You know, not only is efficiency of an aerator important, but also it's durability, you know, what the service life of the thing is and what the maintenance requirements are. And, you know, once you decide on the one you want to use, most of the aerators that have actually survived on the market are reasonably good. You know, even though the Asian aerators work okay, they could be improved a lot. But, but uh, you know, most of them that have survived in the market at least do a fairly good job. And, <laughs> you know, you just need to monitor the oxygen some way, either manually or with the device, so you can learn when the not to over aerate or not to under aerate. You don't want to do either one. If you under aerate, you know, the fish will still be stranded. That's one of the main problems we've had with aeration with, with uh, most catfish farmers in the U.S. is they don't want to put enough aeration in the pond. They think, well, you know, the aeration just going for the fish. I guess is the idea. I'm not sure. I always tell them, you know, if you didn't put more aeration in, but most people won't. You know, they, they, they see the aeration just going for the fish, and the oxygen just going to the fish, and they're thinking, well, if I put this aeration in there, I'm going to stop more fish. So what they do is they put the aeration in there, and they put more fish in, and they're right back where they started, except they just got a lot more fish suffering than they did before. And so even though it allows big production, you're not getting very efficient production because the FCR is not as good, and you got a lot of more talent. Kind of the opposite problem happened in shrimp farming. I think most shrimp farmers, maybe it's because of the value of the crop, but they tend to, at least in Asia, use more aeration than they need. And it also, maybe it's because in Asia, nobody ever monitors oxygen and they want to have enough aeration in the pond if they don't have low oxygen. But whatever the reason, you know, the, there's been a fairly poor job of uh, managing aeration runtime and aeration capacity in the pond with with the biomass and that way standards. And you know the energy for aeration in fish is you know, you, if you look at land use and aquaculture and water use in aquaculture, it compares it's just as just about as good as which well, better than pigs and about as good as chicken, best way to put it. And a whole lot better than beef. But if you look at energy use, 
Aquaculture uses a whole lot more energy than does the other types of animal production. And because of that, is because we have to use so much aeration. And I've already explained why it has to be a lot of aeration. But then the other thing is that we really don't have to use as much energy as we're using because aerators are often not used properly. And so the, the, there's a, should be an effort to, to ser do several things. One is match the motor that's running the aerator to the air, actual aerator load. That's a particular problem in Asia where they use those foreign made aerators. They don't match the motors to the load. Sometimes they've got a 14 horsepower diesel, little diesel engine sitting up there running a load that probably needs a three horsepower motor to turn it. Then in other cases, they may overload the motors, but you know, there's a, they need a lot more effort to match the energy use with the actual need for oxygen in the pond. And that would reduce this high energy requirement for fish production. Another thing you understand in these uh, heterotrophic systems you don't have so much phytoplankton, so it's going to require more oxygen but from aeration because of the fact that there's not as much oxygen produced by the phytoplankton. And another thing is most of those heterotrophic systems, they put a carbohydrate source like sugar or molasses or something in the pond, and that has a big oxygen demand. And so you've got to add more aeration to that. So a green water pond is going to require less energy for aeration than will with those heterotrophic systems. But the heterotrophic system gives you much higher production of the same amount of water. And so it increases the savings on land and water, but it requires more energy. But we do need to, aeration is a major, has a major demand for energy, and we do need to increase the out of energy used for aeration. Another thing I want to point out here is that aquatic animals' energy budget, you know, if you feed them and you get energy in and the food and you get energy out and feces and excretion and digestion and routine activity and swimming, and then you have some growth. And the active energy is mainly the energy expenditure for swimming against the current. And that's a kind of a general equation that you can calculate for the amount of energy for swimming. And you see it's related to the velocity of the water. So the greater water velocity, the more energy the animal has to maintain, it has to use to maintain its position in the current. And so the water, the, it, there's a water velocity where growth is optimal. Fish is supposed to water velocity greater than optimum for growth or Often more physiologically fit and disease resistant. So, you know, make them swim against the current may have some benefit, benefit in the quality of the meat and for disease resistance. But also, you know, they, they may even taste better, but if you get too far, much water velocity, you know, they're going to have to spend so much energy against it, it's going to, you know, it's not going to be beneficial. So, we need some kind of balance. Among the yeah. optimal water velocity for growth and physiological health and body condition. White legged shrimp, there you see, they're, they're affected by water velocities negatively affected. Actually, they, they don't grow as well if water velocity is over about five centimeters per second. And the optimal velocity is calculated to be somewhere around 0 0.63 to 2.78 centimeters per second. And all this aerator design, you know, all I was ever involved in, we weren't really concerned so much with the water velocity. We were trying to get the maximum oxygen transfer. So we really need to kind of work out the best water velocity. That's just some optimal water velocities for several different species. See, some could have a much higher optimum water velocity than others, but, but that, that, this has never really been considered much in aeration. And also, you know, when you put aerators in a pond, as I show in this slide, you now the water velocities are going to be the greatest right out in front of those aerators. And if you put several aerators in the pond, and like you had them around the sides of the pond and get the water to circulate, they're going to erode the embankments. And in this area where the water velocities are high, I, I'm not sure the numbers are big enough for you to see well, but you see the highest water velocities are out here around the edges in front of the aerators and out here at the center, the water velocities are much lower and the seventh 
Kim lays out there, and that sediment that comes anaerobic and the shrimp will use that area of the pond. And then there would be some of these areas of the pond where the block, water block is too fast for the shrimp. And so you're going to restrict the shrimp into just a certain area of the pond bar. So if you do, you know, if you don't have the if you have a lot of high water velocities and a lot of low water velocities in the same pond, that's the usual situation. The shrimp are going to pick out a certain part of the pond to accumulate. That's just short cars and shrimp out of a pond and look at that pile of sediment in the middle. <laughs> they do better than that now. This is kind of a long time ago when I took that picture. That pond had a center drain in it, but they buried it, as you can see. But this is a water velocity is in a pond with a four, what is about a 0.6 hectare pond, 0.56 hectare pond. It had four one horsepower panel wheel aerators. So you can kind of see the distribution of the water velocities. And this is with jet aerators. They seem to be a little bit better than the paddle wheels for water velocity, but not necessarily the transferring off. There, there's the water velocity over the bottom of the pond aerator paddle wheels and water jet aerators. See, the area at the bottom is less than five centimeters, which the shrimp was kind of a boy because of sedimentation. 38% of the pond with the paddle wheel, 54% with the water jet, where the water velocity is too high, you see, it's measured greater than when you paddle wheel here, 4% of the area, but 39% is greater than 10. But this is probably something we should take better. Pay better attention to in the future. So this is just about shrimp here. The shrimp and generally the forward areas of water currents less than five centimeters per second. And they're sure going to avoid places where the, you know, if it's greater than five centimeters per second, they're avoiding it because of the current. And where it's less than five centimeters, two centimeters per second, they avoid it because of sedimentation. Water velocities narrated pond range about one centimeter per second in some cases over 100 centimeters per second the erosion of earthwork usually occurs at around 7.5 to 15 centimeters per second sedimentation only occurs where the velocities are less than three centimeters per second and you know what what they've done in a lot of places is put Plastic liners around the ponds, or at least around the sides, to cut down on the earth rope erosion. So that's about all I had for pairs here. So if uh, anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Each species probably has its optimum velocity for growth. And the velocity is also going to influence the quality of the meat to some extent. And a lot more needs to be done on that. All I'm pointing out is that most of what we know about air racing right now is based on oxygen. We know it's beneficial to have the water circulation. It's even beneficial for the aeration itself because it has to move the oxygen, I mean, the water away from the aerator to keep the water around the aerator from become saturated with oxygen and that reducing aeration efficiency. You know, in shrimp farming, a lot of times they use aeration to push the waste toward the center drain. There's all kinds of differences in the way they use these aerators. And all I'm pointing out is that what we know about aeration up to this point is based mainly on aerators that are designed primarily, well, you know, there, there was little thought given the water circulation and the design of the aerators. They were designed for oxygen transfer. And most of the use of the aerators has been for providing oxygen with relatively little thought about the other aspects of it. Then a little more thought in shrimp farming and other kinds because the shrimp live on the bottom. But the point I'm making is the more we learn about aeration, the less we know. We you know there's more, more problems to be after. I know a lot less than I did when I started. And Got a lot more questions than I had when I started with this. So uh, that's what I'm telling you. We're not anywhere near the, what the answer is. And 
You can't pick up any paper you want to and read what one paper says in isolation. People are often, often real uh, careless about doing that. You know, they see some bright new idea, you know, they fall apart, but they don't look at all the downside. Anything you do is going to have these trade offs involved with it. All right, folks. Uh, I suspect that uh, Dr. Boyd would be willing to answer other questions offline if you get in touch with him. Uh, but I want to be respectful of his time and yours. And with that, I think we're going to call it a day. And this, don't forget these, this recording as well as the other USAS sponsored webinars are available on the USAS uh, YouTube channel page as well as my aquaculture education and more uh, webpage. And I put the link to those in the chat box so you can find them later on. Uh, Dr. Boyd, we certainly appreciate your time, and we appreciate the time of everybody uh, attending, and I know that there will be lots of folks interested in watching the recording. So with that, we're going to sign off. I'm going to stop our recording, and everybody enjoy the rest of your day. I, I enjoyed doing it.